The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a woman, Paula, phoning her friend Ralph about an application to the local council for money for their drama club. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Hello? Ralph, it's Paula. Hi. You know I told you we could apply to the local council for money for our drama club. I've got the application form here, but we need to get it back to them by the end of the week. I could send it on to you. You really ought to fill it in as president of the club, but I don't know if it'll get to you in time. Well, you're the secretary, so I expect it's OK if you fill it in. Yeah, but I'd really like to check it together. Right, that's fine. Like, the first part asks for the main contact person. Can I put you there? Sure. Right, so that's Ralph Pearson. Oh, and then I need your contact address. So that's 203 South Road, isn't it? No, 230. Oh, sorry, I always get that wrong. <laughs> then it's Drayton. Oh, do you think they need a postcode? Better put it, it's DR6 8AB. Mm -hmm, OK. Telephone number, that's 01453 586098, isn't it? Yes. Right. Now, in the next part of the form, I have to give information about our group. So, name of group, that's easy. We're the Community Youth Theatre Group. But then I have to describe it. So, what sort of information do you think they want? Well... They need to know we're amateurs, not professional actors. And how many members we've got. What's that at present? Twenty? Eighteen. And should we put in the age range that's thirteen to twenty-two? No, I don't think we need to. But we'd better put a bit about what we actually do. Something like members take part in drama activities. Activities and workshops? OK. Right. That's all for that section, I think. You now have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now, the next bit is about the project itself, what we're applying for funding for. So, first of all, they need to know how much money we want. The maximum's £500. I think we agreed we'd ask for 250 didn't we? OK. There's no point in asking for too much. We'll have less chance of getting it. Then we need to say what the project, um, the activity is. Right. So we could write something like, to produce a short play for young children. Should we say it's interactive? Yes, good idea. Right, I've got that. Then we have to say what we actually need the money for. Isn't that it? No, we have to give a breakdown of details, I think. Well, there's the scenery. But we're making that. We need to buy the materials, though. 
Oh, okay. Then there's the costumes. Right. That's going to be at least fifty pounds. Okay. And what else? Oh, I just found out we have to have insurance. I don't think it'll cost much, but we need to get it organised. Yes, I'd forgotten about that, and we could be breaking the law if we don't have it. Good thing we've already got curtains in the hall. At least we don't have to worry about that. Hmm. We'll need some money for publicity. Otherwise, no one will know what we're doing. And then a bit of money for unexpected things that come up. Just put sundries at the end of the list. Okay, fine. Now the next thing they want to know is if they give us the grant, how they'll be credited. What do they mean credited? I think they mean how we'll let the public know that they funded us. They want people to know they've supported us. It looks good for them. Hmm. Well, we could say we'd announce it at the end of the play. We could make a speech or something. Ah.、Uh, They might prefer to see something in writing. We'll be giving the audience a program, won't we? So we could put an acknowledgement in that. Yeah, that's a better idea. Okay. And the last thing they want to know is if we've approached any other organisations for funding and what the outcome was. Well, only National Youth Services, and they said that at present funds were not available for arts projects. Right. I'll put that. And then I think that's it. I'll get that in the post straight away. I really hope we get the money. I think we've got a pretty good chance. Hope so, anyway. Thanks for doing all this, Paula. That's okay. See you soon. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You have just arrived at the student hostel where you will live during the term. The manager is explaining the rules, and another student is asking questions. Listen to the conversation and complete the form. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Excuse me, I want to ask you about the charges for meals. Are they the same as they were last year? No, I'm afraid they're not. We've managed to keep most of them the same, but we've had to increase the charge for breakfast. How much is it now? It's two dollars fifty. It used to be two dollars. I see. What about lunch? It's unchanged. Still three dollars. Does dinner still cost three dollars? Yes, it does. We've managed to keep the prices down this year, but the best deal is the three meal plan for forty eight dollars per week. We give you vouchers to present when you come into the cafeteria, and you get twenty one meals for your forty eight dollars. That works out to a little more than two dollars a meal. The two meal plan is also at last year's rates of thirty six dollars per week. We give you vouchers for that too. My sister was in this hostel before me. I'm sure the hours for breakfast used to be longer. Yes, they were. They used to be seven to nine thirty, but to keep our expenses down, we made them seven to nine. Lunch is the way it was, though. Hold on, dinner six to seven thirty. Isn't that a change? Yes, it is, and in fact, the form is wrong. 
It used to be five thirty to seven thirty, but now it's six to eight p.m. Six to eight p.m. That's good. So, which plan would you like? I'd like to think about it, please. I need to check my lecture schedule. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Can you tell me how to get to my room, please? Of course, you're in the new wing, which is very freshly painted and pleasant. But I'm afraid you're going to have to go to a couple of other offices before you can have the key. You're in the admissions office now. Leave this office and turn right and go to the end of the hall. The last office is the fees office, where you can pay the balance of your room deposit. They'll give you a receipt. Okay. After you've been to the fees office, come back past admissions. You'll see a very large room at the northwestern corner of the building. You can't miss it. That's the student lounge, and if you go in there, you can meet some of the other students and see who'll have a room near you. That's good. Can I get a cup of coffee there? Yes, there's a vending machine in the corner. Then go to the key room, which is opposite the lift and next the library. Show them your receipt. And you can pick up your key there. My luggage was sent on ahead. Do you know where I should collect it? The box room is next to the women's toilet. You'll have to get the key from the key room. Thank you. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a lecture about the Miners Hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Good evening and welcome to the Minor Hotel. We are pleased to have you as our guest. I will give you a brief information session to tell you everything you need to know to make this a pleasant stay. The Minor Hotel was built in the eighteen fifties during the Gold Rush period, also nicknaming our state the Golden State. People from all over the country and even from other countries came to seek their fortune here in these hills, creating cities overnight. In this city, many gold rush hotels soon opened up. This particular hotel was built in 1851, but was destroyed during an earthquake. It was rebuilt in 1995 to recreate the feel of the gold rush, complete with articles and actual photographs from during the 1850s. Our hotel is divided into two buildings, one called the Gold Tower, and the other is named the Fortune Tower. You will be staying in the Fortune Tower on the twenty-fifth floor, complete with great views of the city. Your room is the best room in the hotel, complete with private living room and hot tub. Here is your room card. On the card, it will say FT, meaning Fortune Tower. On the bottom of the card, it will say twenty-five fifteen. 
The 25 stands for the 25th floor, and the 15 stands for the 15th room on that particular floor. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. There are emergency exits in both towers of the hotel. They are located on the south side, opposite the elevators. Please use these in case of a fire or other emergency. We have some special events happening this week. Our Miner's Diner is offering a special Miner's Buffet dinner this Friday and Saturday for only $20 per person. This special includes all food, not including drinks and alcohol, and shows for the night. The buffet will be available from 5 to midnight. Because of the historical significance of our hotel, there are some special rules. The first rule is that there is no smoking allowed anywhere in the building, not even in your own room. This is not only to ensure the safety and health of our guests, but also the furniture and pictures can be easily damaged by smoke and other harsh treatment. Please remember that there are items of furniture over a hundred years old here, so respect the rules by not smoking. Secondly, please do not take pictures using a flash of any of the drawings and paintings in the rooms or hallways as they are old and fragile. We are doing our best to preserve a national treasure, so please help us in doing so. Lastly, you will only have one set of towels and bed sheets per three days. This is to conserve the water supply, as there are frequent droughts this high up in the hills. If there are any further questions, the staff of the hotel will be available to answer your questions. In the event that no one is able to answer your questions, I will also be available from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day in the concierge. I hope you enjoy your stay here with us. Thank you very much. That is the end of Part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture on human civilization. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today in our History Series lectures, Professor Smith is going to introduce the history of human civilization. Welcome, Professor Smith. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know when human civilization originated? And what's the development of human language? Well, the first two stages in the development of civilized man were probably the invention of primitive weapons and the discovery of fire, though nobody knows exactly when he acquired the use of the latter. The origin of language is also obscure. No doubt it began very gradually. Animals have a few cries that serve as signals, 
but even the highest apes have not been found able to pronounce words, even with the most intensive professional instruction. Apparently, a necessity for the mastering of speech is the superior brain of man. When man became sufficiently intelligent, we must suppose that he gradually increased the number of cries for different purposes. It was a great day when he discovered that speech could be used for narrative. There are those who think that in this respect, picture language preceded oral language. A man could draw a picture on the wall of his cave to show in which direction he had gone or what prey he hoped to catch. Probably, picture language and oral language developed side by side. I'm inclined to think that language has been the most important single factor in the development of man. Two important stages came not so long before the dawn of written history. The first was the domestication of animals. The second was agriculture. Agriculture was a step in human progress to which, subsequently, there was nothing comparable until our own machine age. Agriculture made possible an immense increase in the number of the human species in the regions where it could be successfully practiced. These were, at first, only those in which nature fertilized the soil after each harvest. Agriculture met with violent resistance from the pastoral nomads, but the agricultural way of life prevailed in the end because of the physical comforts it provided. Another fundamental technical advance was writing, which, like spoken language, Developed out of pictures, but as soon as it had reached a certain stage, it was possible to keep records and transmit information to people who were not present when the information was given. These inventions and discoveries—fire, speech, weapons, domestic animals, agriculture, and writing—made the existence of civilized communities possible. From about 3,000 B.C. until the Industrial Revolution, less than 200 years ago. There was no technical advance comparable to these. During this long period, man had enough time to become accustomed to his technique and to develop the beliefs and political organizations to appropriate it. There was, of course, an immense extension in the area of civilized life. At first, it had been confined to the Nile, the Euphrates, the Tigris, and the Indus. But at the end of the period in question, it covered much the greater part of the livable globe. I do not mean to suggest that there was no technical progress during this long time. There was progress. There were even two inventions of great importance, namely gunpowder and the mariner's compass. But neither of these can be compared in their revolutionary power to such things as speech and writing and agriculture. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.